Sir, my name is Martin Hoppenheim. I'm from Chile and uh, I've been working for the last 25 years in the UN, United Nations um, Commission for Economic and Social Development for Latin America and the Caribbean, that's ECLAC. And uh, I worked in the Social Development Division and I was the director of this division for the last eight years. I had a big team under my supervision, basically uh, traveling around Latin America and uh, providing technical assistance to governments in different issues such as uh, educational system reforms, uh, pro-equality social policies, um, rebuilding the architecture of um, social protection systems in countries where uh, social protection has been traditionally very weak. Uh, so mainly uh, my, my, my main uh, working concern during the last 25 years was uh, like sort of directing um, uh, teams of the UN to support uh, pro-equality and pro-social inclusion reforms in different countries but also I had the task I was responsible for many years for the annual main uh, flagship on social development in Latin America that's the UN social panorama for for uh, social development in Latin America uh, taking the most diverse social issues from uh, rights of children to uh, aging in Latin America, from uh, big uh, gaps in educational attainment to uh, lack of access to uh, public health, from the dynamics of poverty to the dynamics of unemployment. So I'm sort of a, I have sort of an overall view of social development in that sense. But at the same time, that is uh, part A, there's a part B, uh, or, or maybe that's the part B because the part A was my, I'm originally a philosophy professor and, um, and, and an essay writer, okay, and uh, I, I did an early retirement from United Nations last year to go back to my A, side A, and uh, as an essay writer and philosophy professor that I was during my first uh, 15 professional years, uh, I wrote mainly on, um, on critical philosophy, that is, in critical philosophy, main, mainly like considering uh, the, 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 the deep contradictions of modernization and modernity, and uh, to what extent uh, a certain uh, rationality uh, of, um, of economic growth without considering um, uh, the, the cultural identity and without considering the social inclusion right, uh, was part of, uh, of a, partial, a partial view of modernization and social change. So I'm trying to put together these two things now. Um, this critical philosophy reflecting on uh, aspects of modernity on one side and this uh, United Nations specialist on uh, Latin American social development you know, with a more sectorial and specific and concrete uh, fields uh, of research and action, you know, such as education, uh, pro-equality measures, uh, how policies towards more welfare state, uh, etc. And uh, so I think that uh, maybe the reason that I was invited here, uh, because I was, I asked why why I was invited to this initiative. Uh, I thought it was that they got it wrong and uh, that they still thought I was the director of the social development division in ICLEC. They, they asked me, no, we know you're also a philosopher. <laughs> so, it's, uh, so it's a little bit for both reasons. For, and um, so uh, in, in, as a f I think that as a critical philosopher and an essay writer on that issues, my 25 years of experience in the field in social development in Latin America is like a very strong input it makes it like a different way of looking at things compared to my colleagues in the university, for example, right? I don't say I'm better or worse, just different. And uh, within that framework, uh, they had decided that um, I could be useful in uh, what they call the chapter 14 of this uh, initiative, uh, the Social Progress Report. And it's, uh, it's a very particular chapter. It's much more oriented, in my case, towards my uh, philosophical side that to my UN side. Well, first of all, I was very uh, eager to listen because I, 
I, s I had a look at the composition of my chapter, first of all, and I understood that this chapter had somebody from the Middle East, somebody from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, somebody from Canada that I knew well from his books, and, uh, and two uh, big shots as coordinators, really big shots, you know, in, in the world, in, a, in, the, in the field of uh, cultural studies and post-colonial studies. But unfortunately, the coordinators didn't make it to Istanbul, so we're, we're kind of an orphan group at this moment. But uh, as that has been a, also a challenge you know, to uh, figure out among ourselves how to build up this chapter. And um, for me, it's very interesting, basically, uh, to have, because I always had this strong uh, regional bias from Latin America, working in Cepal or Eclac, where I worked. So, um, with not too many occasions to bridge with different regions, right? Like Africans' perspective, um, in this case, Middle East perspective, and in the more broad group of this meeting in Istanbul, uh, the, the perspective from Asia, from countries of Asia also as well. So this uh, cross-regional perspective is something that I was eager to listen about, to learn, and I, for the, f the first day was quite useful in, in that sense. On the other side, since I'm in a specific chapter on, um, uh, with a very fancy name, it's called Paradox on Culture, uh, Values and Identity. Uh, I, I like very much the idea of paradox. I've been writing quite a lot lately, or more than writing, presenting PowerPoints, because that's the new way of writing, uh, with bullets on paradox of modernity today, like revisiting paradox of modernity. And, uh, so I was very interested in this idea of approaching the transformation of culture and values that we are today seeing in the world from the perspective of paradox, that is, of the simultaneous development of diverging forces. I will give you an example to illustrate this. We are living at the same time a strong tendency towards uh, postmodern narcissism or uh, really strong individualism, yeah? like late modernity has been very strong on that, and also neoliberalism as a strong market uh, fostering economy and, uh, and, and a society of high consumerism based on individual consumerism and privileges. But at the same time that uh, we have this strong tendency in culture toward a, a more narcissist and individualistic culture, we have during the last 20 years an incredible uh, rebirth or new versions of demands for equality and solidarity uh, on different sides. In Latin America we have like new political preferences of the people that privilege more equality oriented political programs. We have lots of social movements, national or transnational, demanding equality of rights in different aspects. We have all this new UN uh, gigantic world conferences on equality of rights in, uh, for women, uh, for old people, for uh, disadvantaged people, for uh, uh, discriminated groups, etc. Um, and, um, and we have a tremendous global awareness of how unfair wealth has been distributed during the last 20 or 30 years under the hegemony of uh, the financial capitalism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all this puts together a tremendous awareness and uh, pressure towards equality in a world that has been developing in an unprecedented way, narcissism and individuality. So that would be an example of a strong paradox, like two driving forces that are quite divergent and they're both growing at the same time. Uh -huh. So what uh, I've been like sort of betting to or, or, or posing is the idea that uh, if we're going to talk about cultural and value transformations, what do we have today is mainly contradictions, right? Not one-sided development. Uh, I, I can put like one or two more examples. One, one, another clear example of this is that uh, uh, we have a tremendous um, uh, force of secularization, that is modern values crossing the world and more than ever today, because we, have, we live in an open world with uh, no, uh, no, no commercial boundaries, no, no strong political boundaries, we don't have the Cold War, and we have the new network style of crossing messages from one place to another. So 
So this tremendous opening of the world and intensification of communication throughout the world is a tremendous driving force of secularizing values, you know, values of uh, modern values. But at the same time, we have a, an, uh, a tremendous resurrection of traditional religions. We have fundamentalisms in, uh, in Muslim world, in Christian world, and, uh, and in others as well. So uh, we are facing a simultaneous right drive towards secularization of values and towards uh, a very strong traditional, many times religious worldviews, you know, where people are gathering around them at the same time. So uh, that's another, I, th I would say that's another very strong example of a paradoxical tendency in, uh, in cultural change today. I think, uh, I don't, I don't know exactly what will end up to be my specific contribution to, the, to this uh, social report or social progress report. But I do think that I have like a lot of experience, I, I wouldn't dare to say knowledge, but experience at least in the, the area of social development and on the other side on the area of uh, reflection on modernity and transformations of modernity. And if you see the different chapters of, uh, of this report, you could say that many of the chapters are oriented towards development, and that is to education, for example, or sustainability of economic growth, or crossing economic growth with uh, en 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 environment sustainability, or uh, uh, or uh, transformations into in, in the work society. And on the other side you have many uh, chapters that are, you could say, are linked to modernity issues, like changing roles of families and women, and uh, new forms of sense of belonging in broad societies, etc. So, I don't want to seem that I think I can have a, so, a central role in this, but uh, I think I could facilitate dialogue of my chapter with other chapters because of this. A social change. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, yes. Uh -huh. No, but it's okay. Well, maybe I would, I would have to, I, I think I, in that case I would have a Latin American bias. Okay? And uh, seen from Latin America. Okay? Uh, Latin America considered sort of the middle class of the world, in a way. Yeah? Though inside Latin America we have a lot of diversity among different countries. But I would say uh, one social change, you're asking for one social it's not easy, one social change. But I would say that uh, one very important social change is that 30 years ago, because you're talking about like my lifespan, or 30 or 40 years ago, uh, maybe in, as an average in Latin America, three out of every 10 young people would finish secondary education, or two out of 10, and today maybe seven or eight out of 10. This may seem a little bit like banal or trivial because it's just a gross indicator, yes, but uh, it's provoking a deep transformation of how society reflects upon itself, uh, about expectations of people regarding uh, social mobility, about development of capacities to uh, get into the information society and transform the um, productive structures of the society. So I would say that maybe it's not only that more years of education, like the actual generation as an average has four or five more years of schooling that preceded it in generations. It's more the idea that we are coming into a society with other level of capacities, not only in the production world, but also in reflecting upon themselves as citizens in a democracy.